all of us probably, we probably know someone uh, who could be classified as a worry wart. Uh, you know, the one who is constantly wringing their hands and uh, they're in a constant state of worry. And, and, you know, to be very honest, when we see all that's going on in our world today, uh, all the diseases, uh, pandemics, uh, wars, inflation, rising cost of living, climate change, you get the idea, the list could go on and on and on and on and on. Now, there are a lot of things that actually we could worry about, a lot of things that could greatly greatly worry us. But that would really be, uh, to be very honest, that would be a total waste of our time and energy because statistics show that really only 8% of the things that we worry about ever really come to pass. Uh, in other words, if you had a list of 100 things that you're dedicated to worry about, uh, then only eight of them would ever happen. Only eight would ever happen. So as we consider this thing of worry, let me just begin by, by telling you two things. First of all, I want to tell you what worry cannot do. What worry cannot do. And, and, and I like the way David Jeremiah summed it up. He, he said this. He said, worry does nothing for us. It does nothing to help us cope with the troubles of the day. It does nothing to give us greater strength to face life's challenges. It does nothing to assist us in overcoming the trials of life. Bottom line, worry doesn't do anything that is beneficial. It does nothing that is beneficial. But that doesn't mean worry cannot do anything. Because the second thing I want you to know is, is that there are some things that worry can do. Some things worry can do. Corey Ten Boon, for example, she said this. She said, while worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it will empty today of its strength. It, it can't take away the sorrows of tomorrow, but it can take away our strength for today. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, he, he agreed with that. Here's what he said. He said, worry pulls tomorrow's cloud over today's sunshine. And, and Warren Wiersbe wrote this. He said, the average person is crucifying himself between two thieves, the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. It's right to plan for the future and even to save for the future, but it is a sin to worry about the future and permit tomorrow to rob today of its blessings. Uh, the bottom line that I want you to understand here from the very beginning is that, 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 that worry is to basically be, it's to be concerned. It, it's to be anxious over something that, that it might happen in the future. And, 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 and worrying is about, is something that really, again, can, cannot do any good. It, it cannot accomplish anything. And, and, and the truth of the matter is to worry is to worry about something that we don't even know. And we cannot know because the Bible says this in Proverbs 27, one, thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. N none of us knows what a day is going to bring forth. And, and in James 4, 14, James said, ye know not what shall be on the morrow. So the bottom line is it's kind of foolish to worry about tomorrow because there's no way we can know what is going to come tomorrow. Now, I need to tell you right up front, I uh, need to tell you that the word worry does not appear in our King James Bible. Uh, the word worry, it's, it's not there. Rather, the Greek word, merimnao, it, it, it's, it's, it's used and translated in different ways. For example, the Apostle Paul used it. And, and here's what he said in Philippians 4, 6. He says, be careful, be careful. In, in other words, to be burdened with care, to be burdened with worry, to be burdened with anxiety, uh, be careful for nothing, but in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And, and the Lord Jesus used the very same word uh, in our text in Matthew chapter 6. He used the very same word, and, and it's been properly translated as take no thought. 
take no thought. So as we consider the question about overcoming worry, uh, how, how do I overcome worry? How, how can I get victory over worry? Uh, I want us to notice two key points together uh, for the next few minutes that we have. Number one, understanding what worry is really all about. Understanding what worry is really all about. Uh, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus, who of course we understand, he's, he's the master teacher. Uh, and so the Lord Jesus dealt in a very, in a very clear way with very clear terms uh, so that we might understand this subject of, of, of worry. And, and he, really, he revealed for us five things about worry that, that all of us really, we really need to understand. When, when it comes to worry, we need to understand, first of all, that, that worry is inconsistent. Worry is inconsistent. In, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, the Lord Jesus said, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? And now this doesn't mean that we should take no thought, that we should take no concern, that we should have no care ab about the necessities of life. And, and we know that's true because in other parts of the scripture, uh, diligence in business is, is expected. It, it's commended. Uh, nowhere in the Bible are we told to sit back and do nothing, but we are always commanded uh, to be diligent. For example, you remember what the wise man said in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 to verse number 8. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. See, here, here, here's, here's an instruction. Uh, we're to go to an ant to learn wisdom, and here's the wisdom that we learn from the ant. Having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. The apostle Paul said in Romans 12, 11, that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we are not to be slothful when it comes to the matters of business. We're not to be slothful in, in the business of our church, but even on a personal level, we're not to be slothful in any area of our life. And, and, and the reason for that and the reason why diligence is, is commanded and commended is simply because of the fact that God has a plan and a purpose in it. You, you see, God has not commanded these things so that we can accumulate a huge store of wealth. It, it, it's not for selfish reasons. Rather, the Apostle Paul explained it this way in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. The idea there is let him work diligently. Let him work earnestly. Why? Why are we to do that? So that you may be rich. No, no, that's not what it says. No, so that, so that he may have to give unto him that needeth. However, the point the Lord Jesus is teaching is that it is inconsistent. It's inconsistent for us to be overburdened with care, to be overburdened with worry, to be overburdened with anxiety about the necessities of life. And the reason is simply this. Since our Heavenly Father gave us our life, since He gave us our life, it's only natural that He will also provide the things necessary to sustain our life. Albert Burns in his commentary I think explained it very well. Here's what he said. He said, he who has displayed so great goodness as to form the body and breathe into it the breath of life will surely follow up the blessing and confer the smaller favor of providing that that the body shall be clothed and that life preserved. Uh, bottom line, if we believe in God as our creator, if we believe in God as our, as our heavenly father, th then we must also believe that he is our sustainer. And so if our thoughts are overwhelmed with, with, with care and with worry and anxiety about, about the things of this life and the physical needs of this life, then to be real honest, we are being, we are being quite inconsistent. Worry, it's inconsistent. Not only that, uh, notice, secondly, that worry is irrational. 
It's irrational. In, in Matthew 6 and verse number 26, here's what Jesus said. He says, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet, they, they, they don't do anything. They, they don't do any of those things. Yet, your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? In, in other words, it's, it's irrational to be overburdened with care, worry, anxiety concerning where our next meal is going to come from. The, the birds don't worry, and, and God provides for them, and, and aren't we much more valuable than a bird? After all, God created the bird, yes, but God created us in his image and in his likeness. And, and so it's irrational to think it's irrational to think that the God who cares for the birds is somehow going to fail to take care of us, uh, to worry, to worry. It's, a, it's an irrational thing. Uh, not only that, to worry, let her see, it, it, it is ineffective. It's ineffective. In, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus said, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Who, who by just thinking about it, worrying about it, fretting over it, can, can add a cubit to his stretcher. Now, when I was a kid, I, I, wanted, to, I, I wanted to grow up to be big and tall. And uh, in, in fact, I remember I used to go to the playground. I would hang on the monkey bars, hoping that I could stretch and maybe, maybe, maybe become a little bit taller. But, but as, as you know, you know, you, you've seen me. And as you know, God in his great wisdom chose for me to be short and handsome. Just thought I would throw that out there, okay? Uh, but, but, but really, in this verse, in this verse, uh, it's interesting that the Lord Jesus is not really talking about physical stature. He, he's not really talking about physical height. And, and that becomes kind of clear when we notice that the, that the same word translated stature it's also used in John chapter 9 and verse 23, and here's what it says. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. That, that same Greek word translated stature, here it is translated of age. Bottom line, the Lord Jesus was saying the same thing the wise man said in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse number 8. There is no man, no man that have power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. In, in, in other words, none of us has the power to extend the length of our lives. None of us has the power to add to our days. I'm sure you have probably read how that Queen Elizabeth I of England, just before her death on March the 24th in 1603, is quoted as having said this, all of my possessions for a moment of time. All of my possessions for a moment of time, but all of her wealth and all of her power and all of her prestige could not buy her another minute could not buy her another minute. No one, no one by worrying can make themselves taller, and no one by worrying can increase the number of days that they are going to live on this earth. So bottom line, to, to worry, it's, it's inconsistent, okay? It's irrational. It, it, it's ineffective. And, and then I want you to notice another one, and that is this. It is illogical. It is illogical. In, in verse 28, and following, the Lord Jesus said this, why, why take ye thought? In other words, why, why do you allow your minds to be overburdened with care and, and with worry and with anxiety? Why, why take you thought for raiment? That is, that, that is for, for clothing. And, and then he says this, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, now, now here, here, here's what he's leading to, okay? Because of that fact, here's what I want you to understand. If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? 
O ye of little faith. Uh, again, to, to allow our minds to be filled and controlled with, with worry and anxiety and, and, and all of those things, it, it, is, it is an illogical thing when we consider how God works in our world today. There's one other thing I want us to notice, and that is this. Uh, for us to allow our minds to be filled with worry and care, with anxiety, uh, it, is, it is irresponsible. It is irresponsible. In, in verse 31 and verse number 32, again, Jesus said this. He, he said, take, uh, therefore take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need <clears throat> of all these things. It, it should be noted here that the word that is that is that's translated Gentile, uh, that, that word actually not only refers to non-Jewish nations and non-Jewish people, it, it also is a clear reference to people who, who do not know the Lord God. They, they do not worship the Lord God. In fact, that's why the same Greek word in Acts chapter 4, verse 25, that same Greek word is translated heathen. It, it, it's a heathen person. And bottom line, according to the Lord Jesus, when we allow our minds to be overburdened with care, when we allow our minds to be overburdened with worry and with anxiety, uh, we are basically acting just like a heathen person who does not know God. We're, we're acting just like an unsaved man. We are irresponsibly acting like a person who has no relationship with God as our heavenly father. And, and so, and so to worry, to worry, it is, it is a irresponsible thing. The Lord Jesus in these passages, he wants us to understand that worry, that worry, it, it's inconsistent. It, it's irrational. It's ineffective. It's illogical. It's, irres it's irresponsible. But now let's notice what the Lord Jesus has to say about about the subject of overcoming worry. He, he's told us what worry is. He's described it for us. But, but how do we overcome that? And in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 30, Jesus is going to, he's just going to nail it down for us. He he's actually nails down the root reason why, why our hearts are overburdened, why our minds are filled with, with care and worry and, and anxiety. In, in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33, he says this, O ye of little faith. That, see, there's the root right there. there, there there's the problem right there. Uh, the problem is, is that our faith, our faith is weak. We have, we have little faith. We have little faith. It's interesting. He then follows by showing us three steps of faith, three steps of faith. And, and let me show them to you. First of all, there is saving faith. There is saving faith. Uh, in Matthew 6, verse 33, he says, but seek ye first. Now, here, number one priority in, in every heart, in every life, here it is. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now, you remember the Lord Jesus in uh, John chapter 3? A uh, man came to visit with him by the name of Nicodemus, right? And Nicodemus came to the Lord Jesus at night. And uh, Nicodemus, of course, was a good man. He was a religious man. He was a man who had devoted his life to the study of the, of the Old Testament scriptures. And, and yet you remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, verse number 3. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, notice it, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot even see the kingdom of God. And so the first priority for every man should be to seek a place in that kingdom. The first priority of every man should be to, to desire to become a citizen of that kingdom. And the only way we can do that is when we, by faith, acknowledge some things. First of all, we have to acknowledge our condition, that, we're, that we are sinners, that we have broken God's law. We have, we have offended God's 
holiness. We, we have to, by faith, acknowledge our condition. By faith, we also have to acknowledge our helplessness, that, that there's nothing that we can do in our own selves to earn or to merit God's favor. And, and therefore, we have to also acknowledge our dependence, that, that our only hope is in the provision that Jesus Christ made for us. When God the Father some 2,000 years ago, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God the Father made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There, there needs to be a saving faith. That, that's our number one priority. Uh, the number one priority in every life should be to know 100% for sure that they have a member, or they have a citizenship in the kingdom of God, saving faith. But then after saving faith comes a growing faith, a growing faith. Again, look at Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And that is after we, by faith, become a citizen in God's kingdom, then we are to seek his righteousness. In other words, we are to seek earnestly and diligently that we might become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's what I mean when I talk about a growing faith. And it's that very same growing faith that the apostle Paul spoke of in Galatians 2.20, when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's the saving faith, the growing faith, and then and then there's the rewarding faith. And, and, and it's found again in, in verse number 33, and all these things, and all these things, all those necessities of life that he mentioned in the previous verses, when, when we are a child of God, when we have been born again by faith into his kingdom, and, and when we are truly striving with all of our heart to become more and more like Christ, then, then the reward of that is going to be that all of the necessities of life, those things we mentioned before, all those necessities that, that people today are so worried about, uh, all of those things shall be added unto you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, he ends with this. He says, take therefore. The word therefore, whenever you see that, you need to stop and consider what it is there for. Take therefore, based on all that has already been mentioned, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Someone has well said that worry is fear's extravagance. It collects emotional interest on trouble before it comes due. And it constantly drains the spiritual energy that God gives us to face our problems and to fulfill our responsibilities each day. Robert DeHaan in the, uh, in the little booklet, The Daily Bread, probably you are familiar with that. Maybe you, maybe you even use it in your own devotions from time to time. But Robert DeHaan actually related the story of a certain farmer who, who raised chickens. And, uh, and among, of course, all of the chickens, there was this, there was this one old rooster. And, uh, and, and as roosters do, this rooster was, he was prone to occasionally crowing. And, and, and this crowing really annoyed uh, this man's neighbor. And so early one morning, this neighbor called the farmer and he complained. And he said, you know, that miserable rooster of yours, he keeps me up all night. The farmer was kind of puzzled by that. He said, well, I, you know, I really don't understand. My, my rooster hardly ever crows. And if he does, it's never more than, than two or three times. And he certainly doesn't crow in the middle of the night. And the neighbor said, hey, that's not my problem. That's not my problem. My problem is not how often he crows that keeps me awake. It's not knowing when he's going to crow. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> and that's what's keeping me awake. And, and many people are just like that man. 
Many people are just like that, man. That is, instead of living one day at a time, moment by moment, taking the time to thank God for the blessings and the provisions of the present, they allow their hearts, they allow their minds to become filled to the overflowing with the care and the worry and the anxiety waiting for some rooster to crow in their life. So to get victory over worry, let me close by giving you an amazing promise. And here it is. It's found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 26 and verse number three. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. You know what perfect peace is? Perfect peace is a peace without worry. Perfect peace is a peace without fretting. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Certainly that wonderful promise was in mind of Helen Limmel when she penned the words to the song that sometimes we sing. I won't sing it, but I'll read it to you. And here's what she wrote. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Folks, that is the key. That is the secret to overcoming worry in our lives. And may God help this to be a reality in each of our lives, even today. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray now that you would take these few thoughts and apply them in each heart and in each life. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand how that, how that really, bottom line, worry is a tool of Satan that he uses to discourage us and to hinder us in our work for you, our walk with you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us, that we would be wise, and that we would overcome we would overcome the, the temptation to worry and to fret and to be overly concerned about things that really we have no control over and things that, to be honest, we don't even know if they're going to happen or not. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on our Savior and may our hearts be filled with that wonderful peace that only you can give. We ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, amen.